Howdy, folks, and welcome to the podcast Iron. My name is Laura Mullen Vermilia, and on this podcast, I interview members of the cast iron art community in order to inspire, educate, and spread ideas about iron casting and cast iron art. Our guest on today's show is George Beasley. As many of you know, George was a student of Julius Schmidt at the Cranbrook Academy of Art. After learning from Julius how to run iron, he went on to play a meaningful role in spreading the use of self-cast iron as an artistic medium. In his career, he has helped make this process available to countless individual artists, as well as leading an inspiring life as an independent artist, husband, and father. George, thank you. Thank you for everything that you've given us, your knowledge, your encouragement, and your faith. The generosity that you show to this art form and this movement is unmatched in its own way and will never be forgotten, if I have anything to say about it. But I know I'm not the only one. And more specifically, thank you for the gift of this interview. I feel so privileged to have had this opportunity to let your stories shine. The Podcast Iron Show is sponsored in part by individual supporters on Patreon. So thank you to everyone who has joined as a Patreon member to help me afford the production costs of this show. And I'd also like to thank... (laughs) <laughs> and I'd also like to thank the top supporters of this show, which are Sloss Metal Arts and the Western Cast Iron Art Alliance. So our newest top supporter, the Western Cast Iron Art Alliance, is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that consists of iron casting artists in the western states of the U.S., They were established in 2008, and their organization's goals are to educate, demonstrate, and exhibit cast iron art in the western region of the U.S. And one of the ways that they accomplish this goal is by organizing a conference every two years. Historically, the precedent is that a different board member hosts each conference, so it moves around from place to place. So what I'm trying to tell you is to start planning to come out west for their conference in the fall of 2024. And it's quite a ways away, so we've got plenty of time to put it out in the universe, put your order in, say you want to come. Uh, Obviously, there's no solid dates this far in advance, but I'll keep you informed when things start to develop. And the rumor that I'm spreading, but I've heard it from a reputable source, so I think it's true that the Western 2004 conference may be in San Diego, California. So a big thanks to the Western Cast Iron Art Alliance and their board members for the support of this podcast and basically all of us in the community. So for more information about this fantastic organization, visit their website, which is wciaa.org. And our other longtime top supporter is Sloss Metal Arts, which is a national center for iron casting and metal art. And if you're a longtime listener of the show, I hope to God that you know they just hosted the National Conference on Contemporary Cast Iron Art and Practices last week. So I just got back, folks. I feel like I left my heart in Birmingham. And I also lost my voice while I was there. So if any of you locals find it, in the sand, or well, the last time I saw it was at the spray pond during the performances on the final night, just because, you know, I like need it back. So you know how to reach me. Okay, thanks. <laughs> but seriously, for more information about the Sloss Metal Arts program, visit their website, which is slossmetalarts.com and also follow them on Instagram at slossmetalarts. They're on TikTok now, so go follow them on TikTok and uh, the clock, it starts again, the countdown, the 2025 National Conference. Follow NCCCIAP on Instagram to keep up to date with the developments, but start thinking about what you want to do, what you want to contribute. Do you want to serve on the steering committee? Do you want to take the large mold workshop and get your hands on that big bull ladle? Because if so, you need a pattern ready. Do you want to do a performance piece? Do you want to participate as a guest furnace or compete in the student cupola competition? I mean, everyone should enter the exhibition, so at least start making a piece. You've got two years. Well, 
it's more like a year and a half. So it's really not all that long. Let's do it. And one more thing before we get into the interview, I just want to mention an upcoming opportunity for the display of your large outdoor artwork. The city of O'Fallon, Missouri hosts a rotating sculpture series called The Shape of Community. And The Shape of Community is a citywide sculpture exhibition featuring large-scale works of art in prominent areas throughout the city, which are loaned by artists for about an 18-month period of time. So currently there are 10 works installed, and you can see more details about them on The Shape of Community website. And if you're watching this video version, you can see that I have the web address on the bottom of the screen, and I'll have the links in the show note description boxes, all that. But if you're listening to the audio-only version, the easiest way to get onto the website that maybe is memorable is to Google The Shape of Community O'Fallon MO, which Missouri. When you visit their website, you'll see that the cast iron art community is very well represented in the group of 10 sculptures presently installed. And one noteworthy sculpture you may be familiar with is Kurt Brashears, who is an iron casting metal artist that studied with Aaron Schmidt in Colorado before earning his MFA from Fort Hayes State University with Toby Flores. So Kurt's beautiful piece, which is inspired by the examination of patterns, is installed in O'Fallon's Westhoff Park. And presently, we're about one year uh, on the time frame for this call for submissions. So they will be jurying your entries in early March of 2024. So start start thinking about what piece you want from your catalog to apply with or even make a new piece for the deadline. You've got plenty of time. Maybe something that you cast at SLAWS. If you have detailed questions about this opportunity, please contact the cultural arts coordinator, Martin Linson, at mlinson at ofallon.mo.us. This really is a great outlet for iron casting artists to showcase all that big heavy metal work that we've been casting. So finally, let's get into the interview. It was recorded back in January, so don't worry, you don't have to listen to my struggling voice the entire time. But never forget that this episode is brought to you by our top supporters, Sloss Metal Arts and the Western Cast Iron Art Alliance. Thank you so much for tuning in today, and please enjoy. George Beasley, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being a guest today. Well, thank you for the invitation. My pleasure. So we're going to just get right into the meat of this with my first question, which is, well, George, who the hell are you anyways? Ah. Well, I've struggled with that for a long time, actually, but I must I would say I describe myself as a sculptor uh, who also teaches. Uh, my I taught for 40 years, over 40 years formally at Georgia State University, which is kind of unusual for staying in one place. Um, I still keep my office and studio there so I can hang out with students Um Actually, I'm kind of a vampire. I feed off a of student's energy. And uh, <laughs> that's why, for me, it was just, I kept my studio at Georgia State rather than a separate studio. Mm-hmm. So I've done all my work in studio along with students. Mm-hmm. Um, that was part of my teaching method. And plus, it was like free labor right there handy. <laughs> but I, I uh, go back into the studio. I'm still using it. Um what else can I say? There are too many arms right in a row. No, there. this is yeah. this is fantastic. If you feel like that's it, that's you know, because we're gonna get more into yeah. like who you are and stuff. And sure. I obviously can't wait to start talking iron because that's my favorite thing in the world. But I kind of wanna talk to you about maybe a couple of memories that you might have from childhood that maybe give you an inclination to art or to working with your hands. Right. Well. I thought about that when you posed that question, and uh, there really was one little instant that I remember. I don't remember how old I was, teenager or early preteen, whatever. Uh, but I went to, I was in, for some reason, I can't even remember why, in the Dayton Art Institute looking at a painting collection and was struck by one painting that just so the first time I was like floored by art, and it was a Renoir painting. It was a figurative Renoir work, and it was just so unbelievably beautiful. I was just 
mesmerized. And that's the first art, a formal art experience. And then I kind of forgot about it after that. But um, so I do remember that instant. My background is a family of engineers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't really know a whole lot about my family history until actually I got to graduate school uh, because my granny was, a, I'm proud to say, an illegal immigrant from Scotland. And uh, she didn't fuss around with uh, Ellis Island and that crap. She just uh, found the one ads in, in the papers in New York and went for it. Uh, she and her young son, who was my uncle, uh, she had like split up from a really bad marriage, run off from an abusive husband, and uh, worked in Glasgow for a while, got on a ship, got to New York, read the one ads, found a job in Ohio, and that's kind of how we got there. So that's about all. Then she would never talk about the history of the family at all after that. You know, most a lot of immigrants, when they leave, they've cut the ties and they don't want to go there anymore. So I really didn't know much about the family. But my father, uh, who was born here, uh, was a, inclined to engineering, is a brilliant craftsman. Uh, also a product of the depression and the idea that if you can't buy it, you make it yourself or you fix it yourself. And uh, that kind of culture is what I grew up in. So we made things, worked with our hands. Uh, there were always tools around. In fact, I remember I got caught when I was very young raiding my father's tool cabinet which was locked but i had already figured out what a screwdriver did and i was i took the hinges off just to get <laughs> to the tools <laughs> so yeah i loved working with uh things and making things uh that was an end but i had no idea that was heading to art school oh, okay all. yeah um in fact when it came time to think about college I was on a kind of an engineer and expected to go into engineering, but really not comfortable with it at all. Because first of all, I can't, I'm dyslexic and I can't focus on a lot of things, uh, particularly in a linear sort of way or in the ex a literal sort of way. I'm more spatially oriented. Yeah. And um, I can understand engineering issues in the round but the math would for me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So at the very last minute, I had been dating this girl in high school a little bit who was her, her actual real boyfriend. Okay. It was kind of a funny story. But anyway, he was older yeah. and he was a painter. He was a painter from the uh, uh, arts, art students or art, something in California, arts and crafts or someplace. And anyhow, he was teaching private art lessons and I started, got into doing some painting on the side. And uh, at the last minute, I decided to apply to art school, Cleveland Institute of Art. Okay. And weird, weirdly enough, got accepted. And uh, my family were kind of dismayed at first, but then, oh, oh, okay, if you really want to do that. So they supported me to go there. Yeah. And of all places, Cleveland Institute of Art, at that time, it was probably first or second. That It vied with uh, Rhode Island School of Design to being the two best schools um, back in the early 60s, 50s, 60s, that period. Uh -huh. So lucky to get in. Uh, it, was a diff it was a wild culture change for me. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then this comes, this important little incident that happened the very first course I got had to go to after we got all of our orientation and all that crap, uh, all the tools and equipment and our drawing board and, and the kit to work uh, was a life drawing class. So I go into life drawing, and I'm glad she's not here to hear this, but across the room, you know, looking right past this nude model, which, you know, was okay, but there was really a really beautiful set of legs on the other side of the room. And I couldn't keep my eyes on it. So, <laughs> and then the next week we go, because it was one class every day, 
would be a whole day of that class, the next day a whole day of the next class, Art Academy. Uh, the next week, it is Monday, I go to Life Drawing, change my position in this circle around the model. And sure enough, right across the way was this beautiful set of legs. Because that's all you can see, because we're sitting on these these old-fashioned benches with a drawing board, right? Okay, okay. So the legs see, makes more sense now. Yeah, so I see the legs and a drawing board <laughs> and a beautiful face occasionally. Um, yeah. So that haunted me all the way through art school. It was my wife, Judy. Yeah. We uh, sort of dated a little bit, but mostly other people, but always kept bumping into each other. And, yeah. uh, actually, we were hanging with a, the same kind of group of people. It yeah. was, I don't know if we were exclusive, you know, we're just kind of one group. And uh, at a certain point, my uh, her teacher was Toshiko Takeizu, and uh, she became her assistant. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Toshiko had this idea that that pottery students, which were primarily women at that time, ought to be. Uh, involved with sculptors who are primarily men. I didn't understand all that till a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But she became kind of our art mother. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, we did get married in, uh, when did we get married? Senior year of school in 1966. Um, that would... Um, we got married so as soon as we could, so our son wouldn't have to attend the wedding. Yeah, um, yeah. As, yeah. As as we do. And uh, also at that time, the senior year, I started thinking about graduate school, and my professor, Bill McVeigh, insisted that I had to go to Cranbrook. He said, you just got to go to Cranbrook. Um, at that time, it was the art school. I didn't know it, but it, I, I kind of wanted to go to Maryland Institute where I knew they were uh, doing a lot of steel fabrication. And that's what I did. I wasn't into casting at all to speak of. But Bill said, you got to go to Cranbrook. And I didn't know the, all the connections there. But I, I went out uh, with a couple of my classmates to uh, check out the school. And we showed up. When we drove from Cleveland like early in the morning over to Detroit. Uh, and I don't know what the weather was. It might have been early spring. Uh, and uh, anyway, got there right in the middle of an iron pour at Cranbrook. So I walked in. And this is the only place iron is being done in America is at Cranbrook. And Ju Julius Schmidt was the guy who decided to kind of scale down an iron furnace and see if they could do it. Uh, he had a full bronze foundry and everything. But again, he was product of the... Uh, that kind of war, that post-war period of we're Americans, we can do it ourselves. You know, it, traditionally a sculptor would send work to a foundry, have it done. And the, we, I was on the cusp of that change between traditional art school, was like where it was primarily figure oriented, to the kind of explosion of sculpture of the 60s, making stuff out of steel and and totally self-driven our concept, personally developed concepts um, based on a certain amount of ignorance of the traditions of and history of sculpture yeah. from the European point of view. Uh -huh. But with that American, we can do it ourselves. And plus I could work on my car on the side if I want to, you know, and they yeah. got welding tools. Um, that attitude... So I walked into Cranbrook, and was, before I could, there's big iron pour going on, and I saw Julius over there and walked over to introduce myself. But before I could say anything, he just handed me a shovel. You know? <laughs> like, You're in a foundry. Here's your shovel. You know, yeah. over there. You know, so the primary tool and the first tool in foundry work is the shovel. You got to remember that. That's very important. Shovel. Um, so, yeah, I was in the middle of an iron pour, and they were running the number zero whiting, which is now in residence at Sloss. Mm -hmm. and so that's the first iron furnace I ever poured out of. And they were, again, tapping out 1,000 pounds a tap. Wow. So every, everything was a uh, on a big scale at Cranbrook. 
uh, a lot of students broadcastings that were well over a thousand, you know, 2,000, 3,000. Jim Searles did a 3,600 pound single bore bronze piece while I was there. I mean, it was, it was like, this is magic. Mm -hmm. um, but what amazed me was seeing all these people running around in this wow kind of metal everywhere. And they all seem to know what they're doing, it, yeah. but with no obvious direction. And it was like a ballet, but on steroids, you know, and I, I got to be here. This is just, this is insane. And it's just my kind of place. So I tried, I got accepted in. I applied, got accepted in, but not enough money. We didn't have a, Judy and I didn't have any money. We were, you know, married, baby, and uh, students. Um, so I worked in a year, a kind of gap year to raise enough money. I, even though I got accepted, I couldn't go. Yeah. Um, so Julia said, well, you can come back in the next year, mm -hmm. and um, which we did. Mm -hmm. And then I got a small scholarship, which he then increased to a full scholarship after we started. Uh, so, yeah, Ju Judy and I moved there uh, with our, our, our young son. And uh, then Julius needed a housekeeper, and he had two children mm -hmm. and he lived in the villa right next to the uh the main studios and he didn't have a wife at that time so he asked judy if she would mind babysitting mm -hmm. so so my son cameron and his son uh janos and uh and the daughter ania who was the ringleader of the crew oh. she was two years older or older those three terrorized cranbrook um <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, they kept escaping and wandering into other classrooms. And yeah. It was, Cranbrook was a special place. It was, Julius made it clear that when you got in, he said, okay, you made it. You're here. You're the best in the world. There's nothing else. Yeah. Work your ass off, mm. you know, mm -hmm. and that was it. He, he didn't really criticize, crit our works. In fact, I was speaking to one of my classmates I think it was the end of my first year. I was talking to Richard Medlock, and he said, you know, has Julius ever talked to you about your work? And I said, no, not really. All he does is talk to me about your work. <laughs> and they said, well, that's what he does with me. He talks to me about your work. Oh. So what Julius did, he got us talking to each other about our work. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, 10 students, we're all talking about our work. Julius is not talking to us about our work. He's just yelling at us, get back to work. Yeah. You know, so what are you doing? Sleeping in all night or something? Get in here in the morning, you know? Um, it was that kind of rough and tumble mm -hmm. attitude. But we really had intense, deep discussions about why we're doing this, you know, what is it about? And because it was in, not from a faculty member, but it's each other, we could get pretty personal. Yeah. You know, so and and we did. Those times I think just set me, I knew I was an artist then. That was the only life I would ever have. Yeah. But an, another interesting occurrence happened then is my father came up to visit and he said, and I was pouring some metal, and he said, Did you know your uncle got a medal from the Queen for a mold that he did? I said, what? I said, yeah, um, this is in Scotland. I finally found out that I come from a whole line of iron workers out of uh, the central belt in Scotland that goes back to the start of iron. Um, in the Falkirk area, uh, my grandfather, great-grandfather, uh, was a master molder at Smith & Wellstood Foundry over there. So I started finding out this stuff. But until that time, I didn't know anything about that background. Huh. And it, But he didn't know a whole lot. I finally found out more from my his younger brother who had more information about the family right on his deathbed. Actually, he told me a bunch of stuff. Wow. Uh, yeah. That period. But I started chasing it down uh, yeah. later on. And later... Uh, I went to Scotland and 
1982 to help a friend that I met, met out in Oakland, uh -huh. a Scottish sculptor who was setting up a set of studios in northern Scotland and Aberdeenshire called the Scottish Sculpture Workshop. Okay. And he asked me to come over and help him set it up, which I did. And uh, But to get there, I, um, I wrote to all the foundries in Scotland and asked if they could give me stuff. Yeah. You know, yeah. And I said, I'm going to go build an iron furnace up in, uh, up in uh, Aberdeenshire. And they were going to, and I got these letters about what, <laughs> you know, so like, what are you doing? Who are you? And I said, uh, but sure, stop on by. And I did. So I got a bunch of materials and supplies and drove in this wildly overloaded, tiny little truck up, up there. And we built a small iron furnace. And so in 1982 started, we were the first small studio iron in Britain at that time. Uh -huh. And way up in Scotland. Yeah. We did, did a lot of pours. Uh, but back to 1970. So I was at Cranbrook. I got in at 68 and graduated in 70 and then went to Georgia State University and uh, I had other job offers because if you were at Cranbrook at that time, everybody leaving was getting job offers. Mm -hmm. And I I had gotten one that was sounded pretty good, but it was in Indiana. And I, I really didn't want to go to Indiana. It just seemed like I, I wanted to get to the coast, maybe New England or something. Mm -hmm. And um, we were again in the foundry working and a lot of noise. I got a, and we had a pay phone that rang and it was for me. And there was a guy talking on the phone. I thought it was Indiana saying, do you want to come up for an interview or over? And I said, oh, sure, sure. Just send me the details. I got to, but I can't hear you. We're working. Just send me some stuff and I'll, I'll come up. I'll, yeah. Yeah. So it comes out. It's an invitation from Georgia state in Atlanta. You know, <laughs> Atlanta, where is that? And uh, never even heard of it. Yeah. And uh, so it was crappy weather in Detroit. I was welding on this piece out in snow up to my knees with cables stretched out out the windows. Yeah. Because uh, I did fabrics, metal fabrication. And uh, and I had this chance to go to Atlanta in the spring. Yeah. And I got off, I did, got off the plane. There were like trees, you know. <laughs> I didn't even see, in Detroit, there aren't any trees <laughs> except at Cranbrook. But, yeah. you know, it's a big dirty, the snow comes down in Detroit kind of brown and gray oh wow it was a rough working yeah you know steaming hard uh blue collar town yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so anyway it was kind of neat there was a brand new building they built and uh they decided to, to move there which when i got home judy said you what and uh where is that and and the, for about the first 10 years, she said, one more year, we're out of here. Yeah. So it was south. It was the south. It was segregated. Mm -hmm. In fact, on our way down, uh, Easy Rider, Rider had just come out as a movie. And and my friends in the studio were saying, you know, they kill hippies down there. Oh, no. You don't want to go there. I said, no, this is a bunch. But it wasn't that way at all. Yeah. I mean, the south's pretty great. Um, but we we stayed. Weirdly enough, we, and we got a free hand to build anything we wanted. Um, but also, interestingly, we it was before computers, really, before any social media or internet. Mm -hmm. And I left Cranbrook, and two years later, built this big old iron furnace that we started running, mm -hmm. and uh, then moved it out to the country to a farm called Happy Valley, a pretty wild farm of ceramics people run by Jerry Chappelle. And he had this annual party called Scorpio Rising, where he yeah. invited the, the, the world. It was kind of like the, the Woodstock of, uh, of sculpture and ceramics. Um, you know, we had, and glass blowing. I mean, who's who in the glass like blowing came like Harvey Littleton and uh, uh, Fritz Dreisbach. It was all these like big name people hanging out to camp for a week and make stuff. And I had my big furnace. Uh, so we poured about six or 8,000 pounds of iron on that first workshop out of the, out of the piece. 
And, you know, everybody's doing their stuff. Actually, we were running so much protein that we froze up a thousand pound horizontal tank of propane. Oh, my gosh. We were using it so, so many hoses and regulators running off it to various furnaces and kills and um, armors and that we literally froze a thousand pound tank. And it was pretty amazing. Uh, but those were wild times. And that's where I met um, Cliff Prokoff came down. I met him there. But I didn't know anything about Wayne at all um, up in Minnesota. And he has started pouring iron a couple of years before me mm-hmm. with a little furnace that, here's the name, Steve Daly had brought up to Minnesota from Cranbrook in like 60, let me look at this thing, in 1960. Six, sixty-seven, uh, right in that period. Yeah, that he, yeah, sixty-seven, sixty-eight. He did a workshop up in Minnesota. So he was the Steve Daly was the first person to to actually take iron out of Cranbrook. Okay. Um, Julius didn't do workshops like that, mm-hmm. uh, but we started doing it. Mm-hmm. I started doing small ones at uh, around the south. And, and um, of course, built my furnace. And they were running in Minnesota with a lot of great university support. I mean, Minneapolis was, the, the and Minnesota uh, puts money in the arts. And, uh, I mean, you know, the walkers there and all kinds of things. I was in the South where what is art? I mean, Atlanta was a sports town. Yeah. The last thing on the, in fact, Georgia to this day, has the lowest art or culture uh, uh, funding of anywhere in America. Mm. So at Georgia State, we started building a student kind of in spite of the university. It was our, uh, we had a great crew of young artists uh, because it was a kind of more of a night school than anything. We had a lot of uh, older students, uh, People who had already out working, probably married, Mm -hmm. that uh, could come to school at night. Mm -hmm. And uh, we encouraged that. So the average age at Georgia State when I started was 27. And the majority were actually married. Mm -hmm. And and half of those were married to each other, both going to school or whatever. And uh, so it was an older group, but they were seriously dedicated uh, to the point of, you know, working day and night in the studio. I was never, never closed down. So we're running this whole thing with a lot of work going on in Georgia with no communication really to the outside world, no conferences, Mm -hmm. um, nothing like that except for the ISC. Actually, it was the first one were the old bronze cancer conferences Bronze casting in Lawrence, Kansas. Okay, and I went to one of those, and that's that's the start of the uh, International Sculpture Center. Okay, really, the roots of that was the the conference in uh, uh, Lawrence, Kansas. And then we, I went to a couple of the early uh, ISC conferences, but we had no money to travel, so I had to self fund. Or, you know, no travel money. Mm-hmm. So, I, man, I didn't go to many things, kind of out of contact. Uh, and it was at one point, Wayne Poltresk, I think through uh, Cliff Prokoff, had experienced the whole Scorpio Rising thing mm-hmm. and told Wayne about it. And then Wayne contacted me and asked if I would come up as a visiting artist, which I did. And that's when we first met each other and got, I met a lot of the, his students who, he had a great influence and spread across America. His students went everywhere. Yeah. Uh, mine were doing the same, but they weren't particularly that linked into metal casting. Um, to be honest, my attitude towards casting when I first came to Georgia State was, well, let's build this big furnace, but I don't use it. I'm still fabricating welding steel. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only time I did a few castings for my own was to make a part to weld into something else. And it didn't matter what metal, because I was going to paint it anyway. Oh. Um, so really making iron was just, okay, it's just another stuff I can use. But the ceremony, the kind of crew development, the 
the morale that something like that builds it's a studio it's a crew builder yeah and i realized that from cranbrook so that's why i built the first furnace in fact julius came down for the first pour he actually traveled out of cranbrook and he thought i was building he had sent he sent me a drawing uh -huh. and it was the same drawing of the furnace that wayne had gotten from cliff uh, from Steve Daly. Okay. Steve left that in Minnesota, mm -hmm. and Wayne was one of the students there, yeah. a young teacher, and he hung out at the first pour that Daly did, yeah. and then Daly put that furnace there. Yeah. So Wayne was running the seven and a half inch cupola. Uh, meanwhile, I built a 27 inch cupola. Um, when Julius saw that, he thought it was going to be the same little cupola. He walked in the studio and said, uh, well, they, after a string of expletives, yeah. he said, what the fuck are you doing with it? I mean, what are you, you know, <laughs> he said, are you out of your mind? And uh, we hadn't even lined it yet. And it went from the floor to the ceiling in my studio uh, in, when we had it assembled. So we had a week to line the thing out, get it running. We The first pour was at a public park called Piedmont Park for an art festival. Okay. The ladles we were using were 500 pound ladles and i've got pictures to prove this i could send you a couple guys kept one on each end sometimes two on each end pouring out of these well they were five gallon ladles you know five gallon cans lined out okay yeah so they held three to 300 to 500 pounds oh my gosh um and we ran this furnace, and of course it had to rain. We had a huge rainstorm. The as soon as we started tapping, our charges, charge buckets, which were 50 pounds a charge, were filling up with water. So we were dumping iron and water in the top of the furnace. We got about four or five taps out before we froze the furnace. Mm -hmm. And then the festival lasted a week. So we the next day. We broke down the furnace, took this giant iron slug out of the middle, rebuilt it, and then got it going for the next pour, um, which we had good weather for. But Julius, we had no molds either ready when he should go. <laughs> Naturally said, you know, where are the molds? Where, you know. So he, he well, you'd have to have known Julius. He was not happy, but he was also kind of infected by what we were doing mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. and he's he is so he's sort of my art father. Mm -hmm. Um probably the only person that never got in a fight with him that of all of his students mm -hmm. he was he was um a challenging person. Um mm -hmm. uh, a lot of legends he was rough uh, also brilliantly educated. Mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of a lot of contradictions, you know, but he he created this kind of uh, explosion of artists that came out of Cranbrook. Wow. Um, yeah. You know, I think we spread out, my colleagues and I, to all over America and started art programs because uh, that was kind of the beginning of sculpture in America was the 60s. Yeah. A real, uh, the, the, uh, a whole new thing that was not related to Europe. Mm -hmm. You know, it was kind of like right out of uh, that, like I said before, the the American sort of, we can do it ourselves and and uh, we're too, too busy making things to think about it. And then, of course, after we made it, we'd have to think about it. So what's this about, you know? Yeah. So kind of a backwards approach. Uh, to art making, especially when you compare it to European systems, yeah. which um, uh, I got kind of involved with an exchange with people in Glasgow School of Art after I was teaching at Georgia State, and we would trade students. And in Glasgow, there you talked about the work until it was in critique, until it was time to build it after much discussion. Oh, right. That's different. And in, in America, we build it and then talk about it mm -hmm. and tear it down and decide what figure out what we did. So those two kind of approaches, I would send my least articulate students to um, Glasgow and, and my friend Paul Cosgrove would send his um, uh, most articulate with no experience in making to me. Mm -hmm. And they would both go, not, all students were just like, oh my God, what am I into? Yeah. 
And uh, all of them t- turned out to be really good artists. In fact, at the last Iron Conference, one of those people was uh, Ben, um, Poppy Ben Whitson. Mm-hmm. I don't know if uh, any, any of the people that went to the Berlin Conference would have run into Ben, either in a dress or not in a dress, um, but still with a full beard. <laughs> you have to know Ben. Yeah. Uh, one of my dearest friends now, but also one of my, I mean, the students just tore him up when he first came because he started talking at the first critique and they said, wait a minute, shut up. You haven't made anything. <laughs> and he, but I haven't told you yet. And he, <laughs> then they said, well, you got to make it before we talk about it. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Just watching the way different systems work. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I'm rambling on. No, I think it's great because it's like you can learn so much just by having your stimuli shook up, you know, and and it. Yeah. If they were sending over the most articulate but least makerly, you know, that's that's what the student that's what that student needed at that time. And, exactly. And you and your um, colleague had the foresight to see that, and that's oh, yeah. that's yeah. amazing. And Paul and I, yeah, Paul and I went on to do several projects together, uh, both in this country and over in, in Britain. Mm-hmm. Um, so and he's retired now and fishing. Oh, good, <laughs> good. I mean, everybody deserves that. They, yeah. You know. So where are we now? So you're teaching. Okay. There had, had already been. You had already set We're up. Making the, arm. Yeah. And you set up and, the uh, workshop in Scotland. Yeah, and, you... and that was a little later. But we oh, okay. were at Georgia State. We were making iron, okay, and pouring it, mm-hmm. um, but mostly in a utilitarian manner to make parts for things, mm-hmm. uh, because I was a heavy into fabrication, and my feeling is that technology craft is, first of all, in in work only important if you notice the lack of it. It's not about the craft. It's about the idea, the concept, how well you execute it and how well you get that idea out. Mm-hmm. So we've not been media specific at Georgia State. Mm-hmm. Iron was just a small part of everything else. And we try, But weirdly enough, it evolved over the years to the point where in our last studio, the first, our first address on Edgewood, we ended up with a courtyard with four furnaces permanently set up. And the students could run out and run any cupola or the one of the smaller ones themselves just on their own. I mean, there was never, let's set it up. We never planned a pour except for one a year. Mm-hmm. We had the formal party pour. Uh, but in, otherwise, if you, if you have three molds, go pour it. Mm-hmm. That was our attitude. We didn't make a big deal out of pouring iron okay. because we always did it. It would it was done maybe every week. Somebody would be pouring something, you know, so or, or pouring bronze or mm-hmm. fabricating. It was just the furnace was run just like you would run a welder. Mm-hmm. It was there. Use it if you need a part. Um, we had a, a full uh, two ton tr- dump load of coke piled in one corner and um in fact, I set up that deal with uh, ABC Coke um, when I was, that's before Sauce started even. Yeah. I was go, going up to there to find Coke and the drive up into ABC, it's a long drive. And I knew they were spilling Coke um, off their truck. So I, I drove up in my truck and started picking up Coke along the side of the road because all I needed was, you know, a bit, not a whole lot. Yeah. And because uh, I'd been also getting a Coke from a couple other foundries, mm-hmm. but in, in the local area. But they told me, you know, go up to up to Birmingham and you could at ABC and see see what you can find. Mm-hmm. So when I was doing that, this uh, Cadillac pulls up with dark windows, big Cadillac, stops. And a guy that rolled down the window and this guy said, boy, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm picking up Coke. I said, what are, you, what are you doing with that? And I said, well, I'm taking it back to Atlanta for my students to use in their cupola. I said, you got a cupola? <laughs> you know, who are, you know, I said, 
wait a minute, tell me what's going on here. Yeah. I said, well, I, I'm just started teaching at Georgia State and we built this little cupola and we just need fuel. We're, we're running out of stuff they could give us locally. And they told us to come up here and see what we could get. And he said, follow me. So I followed him in and they, he was the owner of the place. And he said, give, the, give this boy what he needs. And that was it. So that's, that was the free Coke. That was the beginning of the free Coke from ABC. Um, and then, you know, after a while, I told my friends and they hit him up for Coke as well. And they finally reached the saturation point, I think, a few years ago. And it, the company had been sold all out, too. So yeah. sort of like, well, you can't come here and let, get Coke unless you're ordering a trade, a trade part full. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll give you that. But otherwise, we can't deal with these small. Yeah. Yeah. So I think Sloss is going to take hopefully take over that and we could I'm planning on hitting them up for a little coke when I go up the next time. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, that's a good that was a good cuz I think that so I went to the University of Georgia with Jimbo and so I Oh think, god, yes. And I think oh, that, that we got Did you ever come you didn't no. Did you never came I to never the Armed Forces? I never came. Christmas Armed Forces. No, cuz I'm from New England. I'm from yeah. Massachusetts, so I was always back home with my mom for Christmas. So I could never make it out. Oh God, Jimbo. Yeah. A trip. Yeah. But I think that that's where we got our Coke from too, was from Birmingham, ABC Coke. Sure. Yeah. 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 yeah to, uh, our Christmas arm for started uh, actually what happened is back in the seventies, uh, right at the end of the quarter, it was quarter system in, at the end of the quarter, uh, trying to get work done for credit for final credit, all of a sudden the students were making like Christmas presents. So we crack open molds and what's that? That's a frying pan. I mean, wait a minute, where's your work? You know, so well, we're making Christmas presents. Uh, no, you're not. You know, you got to make. We got to finish this out. Yeah. What I'll do? I said, what I'll do after school during vacation i'll run the furnace and you make all the christmas presents you want but otherwise back to your own work none of this gifty craft huh. we, we gotta you know get your own work done yeah um so that started the christmas iron pour and since it was kind of between semesters our quarters school was out Sometimes a little bit of alcohol would be involved afterwards. We'd have a little party yeah. secretly. Um, that uh, that grew to the point where over the years it got more and more bigger and bigger and bigger. And then we actually said it was a holiday iron pour. And a couple of administrative people from, from higher up showed up to hang out and uh, actually got the first alcohol permit at Georgia State for our, our final for, formally announced party. Yeah, It grew and grew to the point where at its height, we had at least four or five furnaces running simultaneously that night. Uh, we would pour somewhere between six and 8,000 pounds of iron. Uh, and kids from various departments would be bringing their molds in. So we had lots of pickup trucks showing up with molds unloading. Um, it was a pretty big arm pour. Oh, yeah. You know? And then we'd have a big party and dance afterwards. We'd hire two or a couple of policemen to uh, uh, as security. Yeah. Uh, and because they were off-duty Atlanta cops, somebody was drinking. They'd make sure they, you know, got home safely. And yeah. So we worked like with our Georgia State Police and the city of Atlanta, because we're right downtown, city of Atlanta Police, for that. Yeah. Because also the studio was in a very rough spot. Mm. used to be called Fort Edgewood. And uh, some of the off-duty cops would hang out, or not off-duty, but during shift would stop in because we, we always had coffee going mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, get a cup of coffee and they see if anybody was okay, especially if kids working late at night. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Make sure they got home okay or would get to their car. Um, so it was kind of an inner city vibe that was, you know, street-wise and very much on the street in the old Fourth Ward. Um 
you know, two blocks from the center of downtown Atlanta uh, and running iron. Yeah. It was a kind of epic days, I guess, back then. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I get all romantic about it's it. It's good. Well, I mean, I want to hear these stories. Like, they're just, it's good to remember things like that, you know? Yeah. And then my crew going up was another interesting thing. That kind of first, I'm really proud of. Yeah. Because it was a lot of older students at first, we also had almost an equal amount of women as men, um, which was unusual at the time. At the very first SLOSS conference, I had more women students than men show up. Hmm. And, yeah. uh, you know, back then that was quite different. Um, in fact, I remember one conference, somebody said, Oh, that's Beasley. He's brought his women all along. And I said, wait a minute. No, no. They brought me. They brought me. They're here. You know, so we kind of had this whole thing going of uh, uh, the kind of equal. Nobody even thought about if, whether it was a feminine or masculine. Or this kind of macho thing just didn't exist in the studio because we're all working together. And uh it just didn't occur that there was kind of an issue there amongst those people mm -hmm. until we went to the first Women Fire and Iron Conference in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And the again, I drove I drove the school bus for the women <laughs> that went up. And these are Southern ladies, young ladies, who had decided to go on a trip together and party. So not only did they bring their others, they also brought party dress, mm. heels, makeup, that whole tricked out thing because they're going to party big time. Yeah. And they went to this iron conference where women are all mach out machoing each other. And these Southern bells show up and they're given the biggest cold shoulder, but they had their own furnace. Okay. And they could run it. Yeah. And they knew inside out how to pour iron. Um there's a long, big, long story about that conference. There was a lot of conflict at the end. They finally froze up Wayne's big furnace and walked left for their final dinner, leaving some unpoured molds that my students stayed and kept pouring. Mm -hmm. Nobody brought them anything food back. They were all kind of shunned because they were ladies. They poured all the molds, packed up, and said, thank you, ma'am. We're going back home now, very politely. And when they get deadly polite in the South, that's like really Yeah, I have goosebumps right now because I know that. Yeah, they, yeah. Ooh. But one of them, Lee, Lee Underwood, uh, was one of the kind of ringleader. She was really great. Older, again, older. So she was kind of the ringleader, uh, kind of the, the senior uh, of of the women in that group. And uh, she knew iron inside out. And she could diagnose any cupola. Uh, she also happened to be married to another person who built a past plastics factory nearby. So she, she helped build a big commercial business before she came to Georgia State. And uh, then she sort of loved the fact that she was accepted in a group of younger ladies and uh, all just kind of nuts over making things. And uh, yeah, good times. Uh, they, 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 they showed up at Sauce quite as like Margie's crew of, of women do now. So they were coming in like their big super team. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, Margie was a trip too, which was my, oh, man. She's, I, I first met her actually in, uh, uh, and uh, the Oxbow, Ox no Oxbow, excuse me. It was the Chicago Art Institute summer program at Oxbow. Okay. Um, and Carolyn Otmars was her teacher, and I needed a couple students for the installation. I was doing one of my stick and twig furnaces, and uh, she said, "Oh, I have two students who want to work with you." And one of them, if you don't want her and you can't deal with her, just let me know. It's okay. You don't have to have her. It was Margie. Oh. And I said, I said, I didn't met these people. And they they both show up. And man, 
I fell in love with Margie and, um, but yeah, the two of them worked really hard with me. And uh, we built this, this stick and tweak furnace uh -huh. on the edge of, uh, edge of the shore, partly into the water. And uh, uh, for the mold was floating in the water. And so we tapped, we tapped through hollow logs at that time, a split log that was hollowed out into two molds. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was all improvised. And pretty neat. Uh, it was a good piece. Yeah, so Margie, you know, I said, God, I, she's great. I had to have, and then she applied to graduate school. So, yes, please come. You know, she was wonderful. Um, and she's now still, in fact, when we went to the last on conference, Judy and her kind of, Margie became my keeper, apparently. <laughs> she picked me up and, and was assigned to uh, take care of me. I think she and Judy had been talking a bit. In fact, they were talking that they talk a lot. Yeah. Over the phone. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Margie is a dear, dear close friend. And they all are. Of course. Of course. Yeah. So let's see. So you had mentioned something before we started recording about a photo. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit. Well, I have a good photo of of the first iron furnace um, and the crew in front of, I think we were just tapping it or just, I was just starting it mm -hmm. and everybody's kind of lined up for a photograph all over it. Okay, I'll see if I can describe it here. Okay, I'm leaning over. I've got a, a Levi jacket on and a leather hat. Um <laughs> Cliff Prokoff is next to me in a woolly sweater. He's got gloves on, but he's got really long hair, so that's his safety hat. Um, Steve Comier is behind him with a bot stick. He's got a um, he's got safety glasses on and a sweatshirt, and he's got a hat on. The crew up on the loading charge, well, they they don't have any safety gear on. I mean, safety gear was a hat, apparently. Um, <laughs> we had no safety gear, you know. I mean, they're they're just that's before we even thought to use like welding jackets or anything. Um, okay. The furnace itself, I'm it, the bottom of the wind box is at my head height, and uh, so that's it's kind of a neat group. But it's it looks like a whole bunch of hippies standing there around a furnace. <laughs> it's very much it's in sepia too. It's it's black and white. It, kind of a sepia black and white uh, photo. Did you say yeah. what year that was? Did you? 1972, three or four, maybe. Okay. In 72, we ran it in Atlanta at Piedmont Park, right downtown Atlanta. Okay. Uh, and then it was really too big, to be honest. So we, I set it aside and we built a 16-incher, uh, a much smaller furnace that would you know tap out 400 500 pounds without any trouble um but we could also run it down to taking off ladles that were more rational like you know 150 pound ladles yeah instead of these big monster ladles we were carrying around mm -hmm. um so i put that furnace away and then jerry chappelle contacted me and asked if i'd bring it out to scorpio rising which i did and uh we set it up permanently there, and it ran for several years before it finally, it won running, which wasn't during one of the workshops. It was just we'd gone up there to pour some big molds. Um, I noticed we had a full lay, a full well, and I noticed white sand coming out from under the bottom of the furnace. And it was, oh, shit, uh, the, the, the bed's going. Yeah. And to get our ladle in front of it, we'd actually – dug a pit to get a thousand pound holding ladle in front to to tap out uh and it was on davits so we had this tilt fern tilt ladle in front of the big furnace and then we would we would decant out of that into hand ladles and we have about six hand ladles running around um pouring all the mold so we would keep tapping into the big holding ladle and then when anybody needed more metal for their hand ladle, they'd run up and we just tip it in. Mm -hmm. uh, but I saw the sand dripping down, white sand. I said, that's it. Everybody out, everybody run. And pretty soon it was a rush. 
and then followed by iron, big, a full well. We had run well. We could get up to 1,600 pounds in that well at that time. And so all that came down, um, melted the legs out from under the furnace instantly. Oh. The furnace tilted over, and we put it in a landfill, <laughs> bulldozed it into a landfill. So it's it's rust, it's carcasses at Happy Valley Pottery Farm under a landfill someplace. Uh, rest in peace. Yeah, rest in peace. But then we ran the other for the 16 inch right right in front of the art building in a little plaza there uh, for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. We built several more furnaces uh, as we needed them. And they did not, you know, again, it was just kind of not for any kind of ceremonial arm pour, but just to get the work done. And uh, I did a few, some of my uh, on-site pieces. Uh, one of the pieces I did very early on was to pour um, a line of iron across the city park. Downtown Atlanta, we have a, a kind of city park um, right in the center. And uh, it was being re-landscaped. And so I, they asked me if, if I wanted to do anything before they piled it all up again. Yeah. I said, yeah. Uh, so we took a furnace over just down the street about four blocks, uh, forklifted it down there and set it up. And I, we, I dug a... I set up a series of cut lines, slots cut in the the sod near the furnace, and we pour an iron bar in it. And then we move it down to uh, this line that I started casting straight across the park. Um, the dirt from each cut made a little mound at each end of each line when we moved it. And then where each line connected, while we're melt, melting the next tap for the next line, mm -hmm. we would melt aluminum in the hot ladle and quick rush over and join the two by carving a circle around the two ends of the two bars as they came together. We pour an aluminum connector over that. And we did that all day long till we ran about uh, 20 iron bars across the park, each one 20 feet long. So that was, yeah across that short section of the park. And it was a line across the park. And that was just one performance work in a day, a day's work. And that relates to what I'm doing now, which is a project, uh, the first title that was really created by Susan Rohr from Berlin, who became a friend of mine in Scotland. And then we ended up showing and working together we had a two-person show in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and we talked. To, she brought up the word "lines of work." Um, so that is now the name of a kind of series I'm doing by casting thin iron lines instead of these big heavy ones. I figured out that the residual metal left in bamboo tubes that I had been using to transfer iron from one point to another. Um, was kind of an interesting item. Uh, in fact, it was, a, it was at Fort Wayne that Susie and also the curator said, what are you going to do with these tubes and these little bits of iron? And I said, well, tr put them in the bin. I mean, I don't want them or anything. I said, well, they're pretty neat. And they, the curator there took all the bamboo tubes and actually arranged them outside into a construction and then laid these iron lines around it. I said, Gee, that's, that leads to something else. So now I'm pouring iron through tubes just to get the thin iron lines, which I did at a previous loss and also at the, the Pennsylvania Iron Conference, mm -hmm. one of the shows, actually Ben, ben Watson, uh, Watson curated that one show um, over that the a really large iron construction was in. So I was just spending these thin, long iron lines that I get as residual iron left in bamboo tubes that, weirdly enough, become flexible. So they're the longest one I've gotten is about 16 feet. It's by up to a half inch wide and is an eighth inch thick. 
16 feet long and they flex. Oh, wow. They will hang and sag until they break, mm -hmm. but they'll get amazing flex. And Margie figured out uh, what's happening is to get the, to get the tubes into a pipe, I have to take out the middle, the middle things. Yeah. You know, the and, divider. And yeah. The divide, yeah. So I just notch the top and then carve those out, which makes a long tube full of holes like a flute. Yeah. As the iron goes through, it's sucking oxygen air through that, mm -hmm. and the which is burning out the carbon in the residual iron. So that it's it's a carbon, uh, it's an it's an air kind of robbing of carbon mm -hmm. that realloys the metal. That's so interesting. And yeah, it's, it's pretty neat. So I'm going to probably in a probably in a few weeks pour about four more iron tubes. I can get about three or four runs out of each tube. Um, with a little furnace I built for my own use at Georgia State. I have a one person first furnace I use uh, that I'm going to show uh, Emily. How to, Emily Baker is our new teacher there. Yeah. yeah she's, she's really just a bundle of energy. Um, fantastic. Good. Uh, and so we're going to run the little furnace and so she can get used to how to run all that and, and the, the kind of quirky things I do. Mm -hmm. I'm so amazed at her. She's just lots of fun. And I, I'm sure she's honored. Yeah. Well, she's got kids following her around already. So that that's the first thing I look at. Mm -hmm. What are the, how the students reacting to the teachers that are there? Yeah. And she's, she's already got a following, yeah. you know, so we're, we're going to have a lot of good times together, I think. Well, she came to Berlin, you know, we did that. She was on our crew in Berlin, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, the Scottish crew, which is good. Um, and, oh, and I have to report that uh, that was the last of the last effort of the Scottish Sculpture Workshop. It's over with. Okay. The place has collapsed. All the crew is left of the Scottish Sculpture Workshop mm -hmm. under because of mismanagement. Uh, They've got a disastrous director and chairman of the board of the Scottish Sculpture Workshop. And so um, the Eden Jolly, who was the heart and soul of the place, left, finally had to leave it. And it was heartbreaking to a lot of people. Yeah. The local community is pretty upset about the workshop as well. Um, but I have, have to say that they our last get-together was in Berlin, of all things. And we had pipers there to play, and um, so yeah, I did. We didn't realize at that time that was probably our kind of last hurrah out of SSW. The end of an era. Yeah, end of an era, and you know, it had a good run, absolutely a great run. It was in its height. It was uh, a residential center for international artists from all over the world, which leads to actually what I'm doing next. Um, uh huh. I now live, as you know, a part time in Scotland every summer for over twenty years. We've been living there, and uh, at the end of the, this next summer, I'm going. I've been invited to go to Japan and do a, a, a work and a show and help set up a, a foundry at the at a very incredible Japanese sculptor studio, Honore um, uh, Katakari and. Kata, as I as we know him, Kata and his wife Kate, who is a Scottish sculptor, they met at the workshop, mm. both stone carvers, mm -hmm. and now they have for a while they had a studio in Edinburgh and one in uh, in northern Japan. Uh, they just closed down the Edinburgh studio because the Japanese studio is growing so big uh, that it's becoming kind of a major little art center, and uh, that's. And they're doing pretty big works, uh, so they've and it's 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 large. Uh, they've invited me to set up, help them set up a file. We, Canada and I, worked together pouring iron into stone, um, and also Kate was doing uh, some um, displacement casting to combine with stone. Uh, a number of years ago, we kind of talked about doing something in Japan probably for about 15 years. So I think it's going to happen this time. <laughs> it's time. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's the next project. Um, that sounds exciting. Yeah. I've not been to Japan. I've poured with Japanese 
um, masters that Wayne has brought over. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, yeah, it's good a chance. Let's see. I'm trying to think if there's anything. Well, is there any other stories that you want to tell us about? Just well, God, they're awesome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, some, just... of them, some of them I shouldn't tell. Oh, uh, that's no. okay. No, I mean... no, no. Really great, great things. I mean, I remember one couple, one of my meter students who's running the part of the department. I'll leave him nameless and he's, he's running a big, really nice program. But you know, I'm really pretty insistent that people do their, their work and get it done. But I side projects. Well, I found out after it was all done that he had had this old Volkswagen bus parked in a garage near the studio. And sometimes around two or three in the morning, he pushed this thing down the street into the double doors of the studio to work on and rebuild. And he'd work on it like three or four hours and then push it back up the road. He did that like all one winter rebuilding this vehicle. And I didn't know about it, you know, which is kind of good because if I'd known about it, he would have been banned. Uh, yeah. <laughs> would, yeah, you can't do that. But things like that happen all the time yeah. in the studio. Yeah. Uh, once Judy and I were actually in bed watching television as a storm was coming into Atlanta. A tornado turned into a tornado. The tornado was then coming down Edgewood <gasps> or down Marietta Street, yeah. heading straight to the big sculpture I built for the Olympics. Mm -hmm. Thirty. It's a thirty-eight foot high structure with uh, 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 over a hundred plates of bronze and curved sheet forms. Uh, you can see it on the webpage. It's uh, called uh, Five Points Monument. Okay, anyway, it's a yeah, big yeah. And uh, anyway, it was heading straight for it. That's, it passed the uh, CNN Center. The NCAA uh, basketball uh, game was champion. One of the games was going on at the arena. It was going right past that. The cameras in the arena showed the roof shaking as the tornado was coming down. And we're watching this on television. I said, oh, my God, it's heading to the sculpture. Ah. It went right over it. The sculpture stood fine. But guess where it went next? The sculpture studio. <laughs> so it's going up Edgewood. And I get a phone call again from the students. and I had about three or four students in the studio. They said, they said it's getting pretty wild here. And I told them, get into the, the only really safe place was the bathroom. Yeah. Get in there, you know, because yeah. it was, you know, and, and sure enough, the studio, the, the tornado took part of the roof off, blew out the roll up garage doors in the front of the building, took those down the street. And uh, so, yeah, they survived a tornado. Wow. So I'm, you get these phone calls from students, you know, Uh <laughs> I mean, that's bad enough with two boys. And anytime the phone rings, I was when they were teenagers, oh my God, what is it now? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And another one was my oldest son who called. He had a date with this really he had the little MG. My boys had this well, a family MG that they've rebuilt. I rebuilt, they rebuilt. Yeah. And Cameron, Cam, my oldest son Cameron had it. And I get another one of these calls. Um it's about the MG. And I said, okay, where are you? He said, we're at the Club Velvet. Well, that's right out down about four blocks from the studio. And it's three in the morning. So wait a minute. What? And he said, well, it's actually, it's on fire. I said, well, wait a minute. Here comes, and there's this over the phone. Oh, wait a minute. Here comes the fire extinguisher. They put the fire out. Actually, <laughs> and, they, and, and, said, and he's, he said, but I've got a date. And can you come and you know, get us. And, and, and so, yeah, I, I um, helped get Cameron and his girl at that time, girlfriend home, dropped her off. Yeah. And he, yeah. he said, well, that's the last I'll ever see of her. I mean, the embarrassment of being picked up by their father and all that sort of stuff. Well, that's his wife now. Yeah. They got married. Yeah. yeah. It's, it, yeah. That's how naturally. It, that's but, how it. but then that night, here I am with my son rolling this. MG down the road back into the sculpture student studio like my student had done before because <laughs> it's the closest place I could put it. Yeah. Um, it says God deja vu all over again. But that's kind of what went on at Edgewood almost all the time. Stuff. 
outside of, I mean, the whole social thing around it was almost as exciting, probably more so than the sculpture being made, which was a lot, a lot of sculpture. All the uh, MARTA stations on the public transportation system, the underground train stations, those were practically all my students did all those. Um, each one of the students got in a major compass, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, a major uh, commission near the end of their time as a student. And the deal was they got to build the commission and then, uh, but they had to bring it in as a research project. So it would be officially sanctioned by the university. Um, one of the, the big ones they did was a large bronze arch for the Chick-fil-A Corporation that's right in a park right near, on the campus of Georgia State now, that um, Truett Cathy funded, uh, or his son had funded as a monument to the founder of Chick-fil-A Corporation, because he had been giving huge amounts of money to universities all over America. And so the the each end of it, it's it's it spans a, a city street. It goes over once one side of the street is a stack of bronze books on each side, and then all these figures climbing over each other to create an arch, in, pulling each other by the hand, and so on. So it's like you know, helping each other through the whole maze, and it's dedicated to Truett Cathy because of the millions that he's donated to many universities. Also. All the people that work at his corporation uh, get free tuition at any school they want while they're, wow. they're there. Wow. It, it's really a strong believer in education. Um, kind of amazing. So those are the kind of commissions. They they the, Then they had to also give something to the studio's return. So that piece brought in a big air compressor, I believe. can't remember what. Um, so yeah, we had, I, I believe in um, the... Re, real world I, half of my students have gone out to become run their own studios as professional sculptors uh the others uh went into teaching but i don't i i, I have trouble with the idea of teaching as a way to support yourself as an artist i think it's good but only if you love to teach mm -hmm. And I, I, I ran into, in the past, too many at conferences, people grumbling, oh, I have to, I wish I didn't have to teach. I could be in my studio working, but that's, and I'd say, go to your studio and work and please don't teach, mm -hmm. you know, because you've got to have your heart and soul in it. You know, that's, it's a special relationship that if you're into it, um, well, that's why I love teaching. I, I, like I said, I, I feed off that energy. Um, and also, it's a kind of reaction to the experience I had in undergraduate school, where I went to school at the end of the academy system, where at the Cleveland Institute of, of Art, their objective was to eliminate 50% of the class each year. So... If you had, my class had 150 students the first year, second year, 75. The next year, half of that. The next year, half of that. And it was to break you. So they thought they would make artists by breaking you. And I saw many good students who could have been great, just utterly destroyed by that system. Uh, the load was a massive load. We carried... We so many hours that you had to at least two nighters every week, all night long, working just to get through. Um, we had the average in those days at the Cleveland, Cleveland Institute of Art was one suicide every other year. The pressure was intense. Uh, there were even cases of students sabotaging other people's work at the end of the year so that they could survive. Wow. I mean, it was intense. It's a shame. And I, I felt that was criminal. Mm -hmm. And I barely survived. I was on probation the whole time I was there. Mm -hmm. um, and my professors got me back in every year. You know, mm -hmm. always. Of course, my probation was for, well, it's a long story. <laughs> it's a long, long story. Um, 
I'm yeah, I, I'm probably the only one who ever graduated from the Cleveland Institute of Art on probation mm -hmm. with full A's. I mean, you know. anyway. So I have a question about a specific. So right now I live in the St. Louis area and I work at Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville. Oh, yes. And um, there's, some, great. there's some photos that uh, we found in the University Museum's kind of archive files yeah. of an iron pour that you came to SIUE and built. Yeah. So, but the photos, like, it's like most photos that are taken by somebody who's not an iron caster. They don't really take photos of, they don't oh. know what they're looking at. So the photos don't, like, there's no tapping there's no oh i'll send you i'll send you uh that piece it's a um it's about uh running fence it's in it's in uh honor of or because of uh, goldsworthy's running fence in grisdale forest and also in, in storm king uh okay i cast an iron line okay that that is a a uh, serpentine line in a suspended form and tripods that is the height and length of running fence in Grisdale Forest. And we had pouring teams on each side of the line pouring. In fact, Chicago Art Institute people came over under Karen Otmar, their crew, to help pour. Um, and we built a, a wooden furnace on a hill nearby out of oak, trimmed oak, boards from a uh, salvage bowling alley that the amazing beautiful wood uh, that they had salvaged as fuel for the wood furnaces and ceramics the wood kills mm -hmm. so they gave us this wood to build a furnace we built a very uh, almost formal structure crisscross board and to keep it from burning down while we were running was a real trick. We had to keep water on it constantly as we were running the furnace. Uh, but we pulled, brought many ladles of iron down from that and poured this line and then planted saplings at each curve of the, within each curve of the serpentine line, which ran about four feet off the ground, three to four feet. And the idea was the saplings would grow up and they were lashed to the iron and they would grow up and sassafras will grow around the iron and they would capture the iron at which point the, the tripods would be taken away and it would be the saplings holding up a certain team line. And that's based on Goldsworthy's concept of when he was presented with a site at Rysdale Forest, he all the artists that were invited there uh, were asked to choose a site. And he found a place where the forest was ended at a broken down stone wall. And then on the other side was small saplings growing, which was once a field that had been taken over by nature. So the trees on one side had raised, were raising a crop of trees on the other side. And he decided to take the stone wall and weave it between one old tree and one new sapling tree, and one old and one new tree, and that's how he created the serpentine line in stone. Mm -hmm. And so that was the concept behind that piece, to join the new and the old together um, in honor of that. And I thought, well, this would be a piece to talk about that by pouring iron that would do the same thing in a wooden trough that we built. So to make it work, I had one hand I had a gallon jug of water, and then the other hand, a gallon jug of gasoline. And as they poured, I would get the fire going in one place, or if it was too much, I'd wet it down with water. And we worked this line, many ladles back and forth, and um, uh, the controlled burn of its mold. So when it was done, all the wood burned away, uh, leaving just the iron line hanging in ch by chain and with tripods, about five tripods, I guess, set up through the length. I can send you pictures of that. Then the university set up a time-lapse lapse camera to record this as the trees grew. 
So it was planned to last for quite a few years. About the second or third, maybe the third year, the, the gardeners there killed the saplings with strimmers. And then so there was some, then the, then the, some more damage and they just took the piece down, of course. Okay. But, but yeah, so that was a, a project of the university. I mean, they, they actually were into it as well as uh, the school, art school. And that was under Tom Geip when he was the chair of the department. Um, and one of my students, well, actually wasn't formally a student of mine, um, Matt Toole was a graduate student there at that time. Yeah. And Matt had come to me from Savannah College of Art. He was a student down there and wanted to see about graduate school at, uh, with us in Atlanta. And I looked at his portfolio and I said, oh, well, you know, you've done well. you got straight A's in Savannah and, you know, it's ambitious work, but it's crap. And he's, what? And I said, well, I got to be honest with you. You, you know, this, this isn't going to get you into graduate school anywhere, any good school. But wait a minute, he's about ready to kill me at this point. And I said, wait a minute now. What I'd like you to do, I'd invite you to come here and build a portfolio. You know, we can, you can do post grad, post courses. Um, what was it? Enroll. What kind of classes? It's called post back courses, post baccalaureate. So he'd already got a bachelor's degree. Okay. But you can, we had a special program for advanced study at the undergraduate level that wasn't quite graduate work. Okay. So, so he, did that and then applied to anywhere but us for graduate school and got into Illinois. So Matt and I have worked together for years now. Also, he was part of a crew, the crew in Latvia. In fact, we were partners on that. He's the co-artist for the big piece we did in Latvia. Can you tell me about uh, that? I That was like right oh, before I, I didn't get to go, basically. So. Okay, there's a th video of it in my webpage. So okay. you want to look at that. Absolutely. Um, uh, it's we built a big platform furnace with a woven basket furnace on a platform, a woven willow, uh, a long loading ramp to get up to it. And then uh, the molds were in three trees that were replaced into the ground, cut and placed as molds um, with a long transfer pivot arm that Matt designed and built that would lift, would take iron from the furnace, swing it around and lift it up and pour into the top of these trees as part of the performance. Uh, so look at it on the video. It's, it's pretty dramatic. Okay. Uh, very successful piece. He and Eden Jolly from the Scottish Sculpture Workshop mm -hmm. at the uh, Welsh furnace did a whole ballet with these uh, ladle arms. He had two of them working and it's almost kind of and, and I think the musical score was done by Alan. Um Alan um here in Atlanta. Worked the sauce. Alan Peterson. Peterson, thank you yeah. very much. Okay. So I didn't want to music. say the wrong last name though. No, no, I was no, like, no. I was like, I, I feel just, like it's I, I do that. I even to my boys. Uh you're there anyway, I go blank. Yeah. Um so they did the score, and then uh, Matt and Eden designed these beautiful, kind of graceful, slow-moving pours that would lift iron and swing it over and pour these kind of almost a ballet of iron in space. Uh, that was a beautiful piece that they did in Wales. So based on that, we decided, Matt and I, to do, he'd bring, build one of the arms, and I'd build a platform furnace, and we'd run the iron. Um Again, the weather was crap. It was really bad. It poured. We're three in the morning. You could all of our visors are totally steamed up. And the final project was to be a, a one thousand pound iron X on site on rocks that were put in permanently at the sculpture park. While the iron went everywhere but the mold, um, it came through these double jointed pouring troughs. <laughs> And Eden, who was trying to get it there, he couldn't see a thing. He was in the middle of this whole monster fire. Um, so they invited me back the next year, and we ran uh, the big iron furnace and poured the 1,000-pound X. So it's still permanently in the in the park. So all the, 
the writing on the X in, in Gallic and Ogham speaks to the event uh, that happened the year before. And that's at Penn Valley Sculpture Park. Uh, at the end of all these things I do, I leave an X. There's an X somewhere, everywhere. There's one at David Lobdell's, you know, yeah. somewhere out in the desert. At the desert, they're everywhere. Um, there's one at Ironbridge, England, in the center of town, in a what is a park now, buried secretly. The the archaeologists that were excavating this area got way into our iron pour, and when I poured the S, they X, they said, "What are you going to do with it?" And I said, "Well." I just leave it. And then I said, well, could we have it? And what they did, they had dug a trench, very academic thing. They dug a trench and documented everything they found, the period. So first they 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 ran sonar, they got all these object shapes. Then they dug to find and photograph what they really were so they could compare them to the sonar images. Mm -hmm. And then they put them all back very carefully and backfilled the trench. So if it's ever studied again, you could run the sonar over and see these objects and other ones nearby, except if they do it again, there's going to be a big iron X in the middle. They bury the X there <laughs> as an anomaly, you know, for just the architect. That was an archaeological joke by that team. Uh, so the X's are in a lot of odd places. Yeah. Uh, the one in Oxbow is at the bottom of their lake because the mold went out and sunk. That was the whole point, mm -hmm. that it would float until it was too heavy to, to float and then it would sink. And uh, uh, the one at Pitt Valley, well, there's one in Germany that's left at the Industrial Museum that we just did. Um, it's, own, it's about 300 pounds, maybe. It's not a real big one. So there's always an X. And that goes back to the old rolls, that, uh, employment rolls uh, that I found at Karen Ironworks in their archives in Scotland. Um, all the people, my ancestors, worked in the iron foundries because it was the only way to make a living. They came out of the highlands in something called the Clarences, where they were driven from their homes by the rich landowners to be replaced by sheep. Uh, so all the little crops were broken, the people driven out, they had to find work in the cities. Uh, this is in the 1600s, 1700s, it's that far back. Uh, the, the clearances finally reached its culmination in the, around 1756, or actually all the way up to the beginning of the 1800s, when everybody had been cleared off the land in certain areas. Anyway, those were my relatives, it turns out. A, and... Where am I going with this story? The X's. The, the X's. X's, yes. And in the rolls, it says Eddie signed his name with an X. They were Gaelic speakers, therefore legally labeled as illiterate because they couldn't speak English. Mm -hmm. So they were, I mean, they're called the, the illiterate people mm -hmm. who were not illiterate. They had history and they spoke Gaelic. They had all their songs and traditions, oral history. Yeah. But, but um, anyway, and he signed his name with an X. So I, that that stayed with me, and I signed my name with an X in honor of that, you know, that what could be, what is it but a mark? And what do we do as artists? The very first point in drawing is making a mark. You have this blank piece of paper. Yeah. And, you, and what do you do? Make a mark. And, and you know, there's a my first drawing teacher that really made any difference was a guy named Julian Stanzak, Cleveland Institute of Art. And I couldn't draw at all. I can't do academic drawing. I was struggling in in uh, life drawing and all that's I mean, just horrible at it until I understood what drawing was. And he explained it. It's a mark. Make the mark. Figure out what that is. Make the next mark relative to the first one. You know, it's that to to fall in love with the, just the surface and the 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 way pigment and you know, a piece of graphite, mm -hmm. the in and out of pushing and pulling. And so that's the way I draw. And uh, the X is kind of like that. You know, it's the, that's more of an identity than even your name, I think, uh, because. It, 
well, it comes out of the heart. Yeah. Um, I'm hearing that from yeah. your retelling of this story. So, anyway. So let's see. I wanna, uh, um, let's see. I, I don't want to miss anything, but I think it might be a good time to think about going. Well, we've kind of a little bit talked about hot on the horizon because you talked about Japan. Yeah, to do in Japan, uh, we'll go back to Scotland in about October. Mm -hmm. I mean, excuse me, September sometime. Uh, I do a lot of my uh, drawing and ma and pattern work, wax work over there, and then a lot of times bring it back and cast here the waxes. Um, so we move a lot of stuff back and forth into suitcases, which is a lot cheaper than shipping. Yeah, just pay extra extra suitcases. Or, you know, hundred bucks for a suitcase, uh, as opposed to like five hundred for a crate or more. Yeah. So we learned right away uh, to carry lots of extra suitcases full of waxes and ladles. Oh, and I have and, something I want. You know, to, stuff like that. I well, so I have something that I want to ask you in the sure. after show. Then I'm gonna make yeah. a note. Okay. Um. So. Uh, because so then, but I'll, I'll see you at the national conference at Sloss, right? Yeah, definitely. Good. I, I, I need to register. I think I'll probably. Oh, but there's still time. Last, last minute. There's, there's still time. There's yeah. still time. I mean, it's still, I there's still time to enter as of now today there, we can still enter into the exhibition until February. Oh, really? I think it's mm, February 1st or February 2nd or something is the deadline. So. I don't don't know if I will do that or not. I'll look at it. Yeah, but, we'll see. You know, I've I've been to so many and just I kind of like just going as a tourist <laughs> and see what and watch what's going on. Uh, that's mostly what I'll do this time. I think I kind of overdid it in in Berlin and was in four shows in the performance and um and we we spent about maybe four or five hours actually looking around for wow. Berlin, but yeah. that's all we got to do. Mm -hmm. So I have to go back as a tourist. Yeah. Yeah. And there's time. There's time. Well, yeah. let's see if you have any advice. Can you think of any? Um, yeah. I mean, you gotta follow your dream, what you but it's it's very difficult for young students. Um I mean the odds of being able to make a living at first, if you think about it, are slim and none as an artist. And your parents are right. It's a stupid idea, but it isn't because it's what you may have to do. Um, I've found that there are a lot of my students have always come in feeling like they didn't really belong. That uh, oh, I need to do this. Um, okay. Bad. There it goes. Uh, that there, I, I and I traced that back to it. Also, also a high percentage are dyslexic or are more oriented to visual mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, research than they are to literary. Uh, in terms of have a belong in the visual world better and exist there better than they do in the expected academic world. Mm -hmm. um, and anyhow, struggling with identity, struggling with uh, being in, the, in, in a school, in a university, and feeling probably more comfortable in the art department or around that stuff. Find your place in that if you if you go that way. Media isn't that important. You have to find the, the things you like to work with, but it's really about your ideas. It's about uh, what you want to say or react to or express. Um, it's, and to take your criticism and especially from teachers with a grain of salt they're looking at your work from their world and point of view and their their values and their time and you're in another time which will build its own values and i base this on some drawings i did in undergraduate school that were just 
slammed and models I made for a piece of sculpture. This is the best. In retrospect, I looked at those things. They were great. The teachers didn't understand what I was trying to do, and I didn't either. So I couldn't articulate it because yeah. I was too young and naive. But and looking back on it, I was working with some of the pure line work that I'm doing now and just kind of getting all the way around circle back to where I almost started. Um, so, yeah, and you can, you, if you really love to do it, you'll find ways to support it. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that's traditional in the art world is uh, restaurants and art studios, uh, theaters and art studios or whatever. You can work in like a, a New York or Atlanta or any city you can get part-time jobs that pay enough to keep you going. Uh, but you can also, if you learn a skill or a craft, you can you can make gates. You can weld up uh, brackets for shelf. You can do anything with your skills and not resent it. Be proud of being able to make something that you can that other people want while you do your art that uh, eventually other people will want, and they will. And it doesn't always come together uh, in a linear way. You know, some of the stuff that you make early on may be more important than the stuff you're working on now, but you learn to go back and look at it and kind of re -evolve. You learn to look at your own work uh, kind of objectively. If you can stand outside of yourself a little bit and also have people that are willing to uh, level with you too. Yeah about what you're doing within within the art world you know that's lucky if you find those people but stick with it um and it's it's the art world is so decentralized now you don't have to be in any special place because we have the internet i mean it's the world is everywhere visually all there but do travel if you can go to con the conferences are great i think it's important to uh Network, I, that's the kind of word okay. for it. But, but it is, it's a, the art community is very uh, supportive, actually. I, most of the real, I've had some, in my career, some very important famous artists who have been just as supportive and, and easy to work with as my colleagues, because they've all been there. Mm -hmm. There are a few real bad egos and, you know, Assholes out. You'll find that in every media, though. In everything, yeah. yeah. But in generally, in general, the more successful, best people are usually the most humble people and quite willing to work with you. And that's the other thing I did at Cranbrook. I got to work for all the visiting artists, you know. And as just an assistant, you get to talk and meet people that way. If you get a job to assist a, a more mature artist working on a job, j jump to it and, and if you're lucky you might even get paid to do it um but that helped me uh, uh a lot and the, it's kind of the contacts i made outside of art school and also uh the networking thing at conferences uh, i can remember running into mary miss um in washington it was neither one of us had enough money for the hotel so we're kind of like sleeping in the lobby, so to speak, on, you know, and because ISC at those days would book the what, four star hotels and it's all for these like superstar sculptors who could afford it yeah. and really like that, you know, get together on their terms. But none of us younger artists could afford it. But I was sitting there kind of half asleep in a chair. And so was this young lady. And we got talking and. It turned out it was Mary Miss. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but look at her work. Installation artist, worked on the landscape quite a bit. And one of the super beginning young, hot young women at that period in, in the 60s uh, in terms of outdoor installations. So, yeah, I got the chance. Wow, that was Mary Miss. You know, I didn't know she was so famous at the time. Yeah. Um, so the conferences... You can you can get introduced around and uh, um, get to know people uh, that way. And uh, you know, somebody will hear about a job and think of you if they know you. You know, and I think you know that happens. Well, let's see. So, um, I 
I'm I'm ready to go over to the after show if you're ready yeah. to go over to the after show. Yeah, I but I just want to make sure we didn't, I mean, we didn't gloss over anything or miss anything. I don't want you uh -huh. to feel like I'm cutting you off. Oh, no, not at all. God, I could go on forever. Don't worry about it. That's kind of, that's the trouble with being old. Um, you, you know, tend to rabbit, rattle on about all the good old days. <laughs> but, but my teachers did that. Yeah. Um, and I, I heard some of the greatest stories from Bill McVeigh about life in Paris in the 20s and 30s, you know. Uh, like, he was, I'll tell you that story when we move on. Oh, okay. What? Who? Unless what you want to know. Well, let me. Well, tell me in the after show. But what should I? Should I write okay. down some things to remind you? Well, yeah. It was like um, it's about uh, Alexander Colder. <laughs> and I have a connection there too. Okay, I just wrote that down. Okay, yeah. folks, come on over to the after show and hear this story. Yeah. But um, so for the public audience, we're gonna say goodbye. So it's gonna seem like we're hanging out, but I'm I'm not gonna. Well, I do have to change my battery on my camera, but so we're just going to say goodbye to the public audience now. So I'll say thank you to everybody who's listening and watching. I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. George, thank you so much for you. your time and your stories. It's been just wonderful. And I'll see you all at Sauce. How about that? So everybody come to Sauce if you can, you know. So one of the conferences that you can actually camp out at if you need to. Yeah. So, yeah. And I'll, I will be camping. I love camping at conferences. It's it's just the perfect mm -hmm. way to get in the mix. And I still, I can still sleep on the ground at this point in my body life. Yeah. So, so as long as you don't float away in the rain. <laughs> yeah. That usually there's like a good <laughs> thunderstorm and there's a good, yeah. maybe That's... tornado, maybe tornado warning. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. More will be. So a lot of. There's a lot of togetherness that takes place one day in the in the in the fallout shelter. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, every time the tornado comes, it, I swear it comes every conference. I think at least the warning does. Oh yeah, I think so. All right, folks. So we'll see you okay. over in the after show. Have a good night. Okay. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in today. This conversation doesn't have to end here. To gain access to the after show where George and I continue our discussion, hop on to patreon.com slash the podcast iron. There, Patreon supporters at any contribution level get access to the after show recordings from each episode um, that has ever been published. So if you don't know the after shows, is it just an extra 15 to 20 minutes sometimes more, with each show's guests where we talk a little more candidly and share at least one more story behind the privacy of a paywall. And the after show from this episode, George tells me about a funny connection that he has with Alexander Calder, and we talk about how realistic or not realistic is it to bring a bathing suit to an iron pour. So yes, if you sign up now, you'll get access to listen to George's after show and all of the after shows from the earlier guests. And if you like what I'm doing with this project and want to show support, this is a great way to do it for as little as a dollar a month. I mean, you contribute, you can contribute more than a dollar, but um, even a dollar will make a difference to subsidize the costs that I undertake to make this resource publicly available. So you'll get all of the after shows and I get a little help and it's a win for everyone. Well, in conclusion of this public portion of the episode, I think it's obvious how large of a role George has played in our lives directly or indirectly. We owe him and his generational colleagues a great amount of credit and debt of gratitude for all of the blood, sweat, and tears that they have poured into this community and this movement. George, thank you. You quietly lead by example and show us how to navigate the delicate balance of life as an artist. You put in the work and you've done a good job and you've passed the torch. And I think you already know this, but I want to tell you that we've got it from here and we won't let you down. But I think you already know that. I don't need to tell you. But also go to the Metal Museum. It's awesome. I don't know if you've been already, but I think you'll really like it. Anyways, okay, I've said my piece. <laughs> 
And now uh, one, la- I, one last time, guys, let me just get it in. Thank you to our top supporters for helping me afford the production cost of the show. Thank you, Sloss Metal Arts, for doing such a great job hosting the national conference last week. And by extension, thank you to this round of committee members for the NCCCIAP. You guys rocked it. I know sometimes it seems like a thankless job and just know that we all love you and we thank you so much. And thank you to the Western Cast Iron Art Alliance for joining as a top supporter of the show. And I'm so honored and encouraged to have your support. And I'm very excited to be able to help you get the word out about your events as they develop. Thank you for all the work that you do in service of the Western region of the U.S. and its cast iron artists. And we all really enjoyed the bathtub rides last week. If you know, you know. And if you don't know, then... You're just going to have to come to the next conference to find out what I'm talking about. But it's also, it's posted all over Instagram, so it's hardly a secret. But yes, thank you to the Western Cast Iron Art Alliance and to Sloss Metal Arts for supporting the podcast, as well as our other individual supporters on Patreon. And your numbers are growing by the day and it's so encouraging the funds that you all contribute are invaluable even if it's just a dollar a month it really helps me to continue to produce these episodes but if you don't have it in your budget to support the podcast iron on patreon that's okay instead please share this podcast with someone you think will be interested in or listening or watching and i'll appreciate that just as much anything and everything helps and i thank you from the bottom of my heart And one more thing I want to shout out before I sign off, that same sculptor that I was talking about at the beginning of the podcast, whose piece is installed in the outdoor exhibition in O'Fallon, Missouri, Kurt Brashears, well, he and his partner, Ashley Smith, run the Spirit Sculpture Gardens and Market Space in Smith Center, Kansas, and they will be hosting their very first community iron pour on Saturday, May 6th, so if any of you listening are in the Kansas, Nebraska, Colorado, you know that that whole area, you should go. You should contact them on Facebook or Instagram messengers for more information. I just Googled Spirit Sculpture Garden, Kansas, Facebook, literally, like, Spirit Sculpture Gardens Kansas Facebook. Those were the keywords and it came right up. But I'll include the link in the blah, blah, blah. Okay, you know, I'm fine. I'm done. I'm finally done. But um, if you want to get in touch with me, you can email me at thepodcastiron at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening and watching. I'm sending you all my love always and I can't wait to share the next episode with you. I'll talk to you soon and have a great day.